So it's a great honor to be here at the Gold Lab Symposium. Thanks very much, Larry, who's had a big influence on the department that's sitting right around you, the Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology Program. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story today that really kind of started from a naive question and then led us to unexpected results. And so I'm going to leave you with some provocative statements, and maybe at the end you'll also rethink your supplements that you're taking as well. <laughs> so I'm a developmental biologist, and so this is what really fascinates me. How do you go from a single cell, this fertilized egg, and then make all the cells and tissues and organs that are required to make a baby? But as a developmental biologist, I'm also really interested in using my knowledge to try to understand what happens during birth defects. And so that's really what I've made my career on um, since I was a graduate student, is trying to understand the causes of birth defects, the genes that are required, and, and how do they act. And so we've worked on everything from limb development, so how do you make a limb have the right pattern and grow and the skeleton in it and the neuromuscular junctions that allow you to move, work on lung development. But really, we've been interested in uh, recent, more over the past about 20 years now, looking at the uh, formation of the early embryonic brain and spinal cord. And really, the birth defect that we're most interested in is neural tube defects that affect the formation of this early um, central nervous system. And so neural tube defects are shown here, NTDs. And it's a failure of the very early neural tube to close. It's a, quite a common birth defect. It's the second most common birth defect, affecting about one in 1,000 live births. And if the neural tube doesn't close properly in the caudal region, this gives rise to spina bifida, which has lots of lifelong complications for, for the child. And if the neural tube doesn't close properly in the cranial region, this gives rise first to exencephaly, and then ultimately, as the delicate brain tissue is exposed to mechanical trauma and the chemicals within the, that build up in the amniotic fluid, that causes um, degeneration of, of the brain cells, and um, so then anencephaly, and that's lethal. So it's a really beautiful but complicated event that uh, happens over about a 24-hour period of time where you go from a flat neural sheet to roll up to find its opposing um, to find the tissue that's on the opposing side so you, that it has to reach across this physical gap and then has to separate this non-neural ectoderm from the neural ectoderm. And then these fuse together to form the neural tube covered by the single layer of epithelium. This is a um, process that happens very early in embryogenesis, about week three to four in the human embryo. And um, neural tube closure starts in particular regions and then kind of zips up in order to enclose the brain and then the, the trunk region of the embryo. And it's not only this complicated movement of cells that's required, but there's many other processes that are going on at the same time. So you're having to coordinate in really tight time and space patterning and proliferation and the movement of the cells and the shapes of the cells. And so I think this is why this is one of the more common birth defects. There's so much that has to be tightly coordinated in order to enclose that neural tube. And so really where we've kind of come into this is that this early formation of the brain and the spinal cord happens very, very early, weeks three to four of human development before most women even know that they're pregnant. And that timing is critical. If the neural tube doesn't close, the embryo continues to grow, and those neural folds will never find one another. There's not a lot that we can do to treat this. We can go in um, afterwards, postnatally, right after birth, and use surgery to close um, that open wound. But by that point, there's already been a lot of um, degeneration of that tissue. Um, down at the Anschutz Medical Campus and the uh, Fetal Maternal Center, um, they're doing fetal surgery in order to be able to close neural tube defects as, other, as well as other birth defects um, in utero. But again, you can't do these surgeries until the fetus would be viable, so not before about week 22 or a little bit later. And that's months 
after the neural tube first closed. So again, outcomes are a bit better, but still there's a lot of problems that have already occurred and, and those nerves are gone. So really, what can we do in order to prevent neural tube defects? And that's where we've been looking at gene environment interactions and trying to understand um, how we can better think about the prevention of neural tube defects. So there's lots of environmental risk factors that can um, influence the risk for neural tube defects. So there's various medications that can increase the risk. Maternal obesity or maternal diabetes can also increase the risk for neural tube defects. And there's also um, maternal nutrient deficiencies. So we've kind of worked on this set here, but there's, but there's quite a long list of um, various uh, ions and metals that can influence the risk. And so I'm gonna be telling you a story about folic acid. And I bet pretty much all of you have heard about folic acid because this really is one of the big public health success stories was to be able to um, use folic acid as a way to prevent neural tube defects. And so just to give you a bit of the history of this, um, back in the 1960s, uh, researchers were looking at women that had had a child with a neural tube defect and were just doing clinical biochemistry, trying to understand why did they have a higher incidence of neural tube defects. And they found that that was correlated with um, a lower serum folate level. So from there, there were some um, trials that were done and then a larger random, randomized clinical trial to uh, take women that had had a child with a neural tube defect and give them more folic acid prior to pregnancy in order to see whether that could prevent and decrease the, the incidence of neural tube defects. And that was successful. And so from the early 1990s, even late 1980s, um, we've been telling women that if you're thinking about becoming pregnant, you should be taking folic acid prior to pregnancy for the specific reason of preventing neural tube defects. Since more than half of the, or about half of the pregnancies in the US are unplanned, um, that wasn't a very good um, thing to be saying, make sure you take your folic acid before pregnancies. And so in 1998, we um, supplemented the grain supply in the US and now in many other countries, over 80 countries, there's been um, folic acid that's been added to the grains. And the great thing is that ha this has decreased the rates of neural tube defects. So in various countries that have supplemented or fortified the grains, there's, in the US there's been about a 35% decrease in neural tube defects. So that's great. But what does it do? How does folic acid help prevent a neural tube defect? So that's one of the questions that we started with. And we also were really interested in what mutations or gene pathways benefit from folic acid? Because clearly we're not decreasing the risk for all neural tube defects. And might there be other gene pathways that we could think about? So folic acid, it does lots of great things in the cell. You totally require it. And um, folic acid is actually the synthetic form, so it's actually more bioavailable than um, the dietary form of folate that we take, which comes, it's um, a, a B vitamin, and you can get it by leafy greens and yeast and nuts. Um, but so folic acid comes into the cell and then um, goes into three major reactions within this pathway that's called one carbon metabolism. And one of the uh, two, two pathways that are really important is a synthesis of purines and thymidylate. So these are the building blocks for DNA and RNA biosynthesis. And so um, that's critically important in order for uh, maintaining genome stability, uh, proliferation, and survival of cells. The other major pathway is that folate feeds in to form s methionine, or SAM, which is the universal methyl donor in the cell. And so this feeds methylation cycle um, that can then methylate DNA, proteins, RNAs, various lipids and things. So based on this, lots of people looked at women that had had a child with a neural tube defect and, and the child itself and wanted to see whether there was a correlation between having mutations within the folate pathway and this increased risk for neural tube defects. In both humans and in mouse, there's actually not a strong correlation between a mutation in the folate pathway and an increased risk. So we need to think in a less biased way about um, what might be 
uh, how, how folic acid may be impacting this birth defect. And so also, most of the studies that have been done and the original studies were looking in folate deficient con conditions. And so if you're folate deficient, you're gonna be hitting a large part of this pathway over here in purines and biosynthesis, and so this is gonna affect cell um, genome stability and cell survival. And in fact, even a lot of the mouse null mutants for pathway uh, null mutants for, for genes within the folate pathway you don't actually see a neural tube defect unless you really stress them by making them completely folate deficient, including taking out your microbiome that actually makes a lot of folate for you. So we kind of really turned this question on its head because in the US, less than 1% of the population is folate deficient now. So really, we're at the level of, of a folate replete population. And we, through um, enrichment and fortification of our grain supply back in the 1990s, and then multivitamin supplements and other supplements, we're at the point now where we're folate replete and actually been taking folic acid through fortification and supplementation for quite a long period of time. And so if this side of the pathway is okay, because we have plenty of folate to drive this, Maybe we're starting to push things over onto this side of the pathway and thinking about methylation. And if you think about methylation and perhaps long-term changes, perhaps this could be affecting the epigenome. And we know that the changes, uh, mutations in the epigenome, uh, ep uh, proteins that re are required to regulate uh, ep the epigenetics either through histone modifications or chromatin modifications. We know this is a very outdated slide. There's more than this at this point, but there's lots of mutations in these genes that can give rise to neural tube defects. I'm gonna come back and, and talk about one of these near the end. So epigenetics does play a role in neural tube closure. And so again, we're back to this question of how does folic acid work during um, neural tube closure? And where, where might it be acting within you know, our genome and all the genes that we know and love that are involved in setting up embryonic development um, to, and how that interacts with the epigenome and then these environmental factors. So I'm gonna um, take a little step back and tell you about what we really kind of work on mostly, most of the time. And that's, again, we're very interested in this process of neural tube closure. And, and we're really interested in systematically identifying the genes that are required. And we use some mouse as a model for this. And we've done a number of genetic studies because we want the embryo to tell us what are the important genes for neural tube closure. So we look for mutations that affect cranial neural tube closure or caudal neural tube closure. Most of the genes that we've identified have been novel, haven't been studied during embryonic development. So we try to figure out how those genes work and we have our own little detective stories. And then really what we're interested in is what's its normal function because why when you have a mutation in these genes do you get these neural tube defects? And so we've spent quite a long time working on this and we've looked at various different mutants that we've identified and um, this kind of broad strokes but putting them into various pathways of again that complex process of neural tube closure, um, how those genes might actually be working. And because ultimately what we want to be able to do is go from these mouse models of neural tube defects to be able to inform studies in the human side uh, to understand what are the genomic changes that occur um, that increase your risk for a neural tube defect in human. I'm really happy to say that everything that we've identified in the mouse, we have found variants within the human um, NTD genomic data. Um, those variants do seem to encode for, for uh, detrimental mutations, but you don't really know that, so we go back to animal models to try to figure out the causative role. And then in human NTDs, it's a complex genetic trait. It's not just a single gene mutation. And so we can also then use animal models to try to understand the genetic interplay between these various genes. But really what I'm gonna tell you about today is this interface between using these mouse models and this environmental um, factor, folic acid, but ultimately, we're also interested in working, again, with um, our colleagues down at the Anschutz campus and at other um, institutions, and ultimately doing neural tube defect modeling uh, using human iPS cells. Okay, so 
this gets back to kind of our, naively where we started in trying to understand the impact of folic acid. And so we were using mouse models to try to understand who's responsive to folic acid. So which mutations might be um, beneficially impacted by folic acid or not. But really, again, we didn't want pretty much every other mouse model that had been tested, and really, actually, very few mouse models have been tested for their responsiveness to folic acid. It's a really untapped resource. But almost everything had been done um, with folate-deficient diets. And again, we felt we really wanted to, to better reflect where we are in our current population. And so instead, we used a moderate or kind of a control level of folic acid that was similar to pre-fortification diets, and then an enriched folic acid diet that's more um, related to post-fortification based on serum levels in both mouse and human. And then we also um, did these long-term diets over multiple generations. Because we're at the point now where a baby could be born to a mother who's been on folic acid all of her life, and her mother may have been taking folic acid during pregnancy. So we did a three-generation cross to study this. And so we started with this kind of naive um, idea is that we wanted to you know, test various genetic mutants to try to figure out you know, what pathways or gene mutations or cellular functions might be responsive to folic acid. And then of those ones that are not responsive to folic acid, based on our knowledge of the biochemical pathways that they, they, they regulate, maybe we can think of additional therapies. So. We had all these various mouse mutants, so we just kind of selected various pathways or bits of things that they do during this process of neural tube closure, and we just started testing these. And um, so here's kind of a little schematic. The idea is that if you have lower folic acid levels, the inc incidence of neural tube defects increases. And so the first question that gave kind of an unexpected result was this part out here, is that um, we know that folate sufficiency is thought to decrease the risk for neural tube defects. So I kind of always felt like, so who are those 35% of the people that are walking around that don't have a neural tube defect because they took folic acid? Um, and, and, you know, how, how's it working? What's it doing? And so our first surprise was when we asked the question, is neural tube prevention always due to a rescue or a closure of the neural tube? If you just, you know, mice have lots of embryos, so if you just open up a litter, you would look and you'd be really happy because you'd say, ah, I should have seen neural tube defects in this population, but I don't. And so we rescued the neural tube defect. But actually, when we genotyped the embryos, we found that all of the mutants that should have had a neural tube defect are not even present anymore. They actually died earlier in embryogenesis. So it's almost like if you have a pretty severe defect, um, folic acid can exacerbate that defect and cause an earlier embryonic lethality. And if we extrapolate that to human embryonic development, it would be embryo loss about week two, or week two or three of pregnancy. You may not even know that you were pregnant at that point. So that was just a first surprise that perhaps not all of this prevention of a neural tube defect is due to an actual rescue and a closure of the neural tube, but there could be um, some exacerbation of an earlier embryonic phenotype. So then the other surprise came that when we started looking at, might there be a dose, depending on your genetic makeup, might there be a dose of folic acid that exceeds a beneficial level? And what we ended up seeing was an unexpected increase in, in, in neural tube defects, in particular genetic mutants, on an enriched folate diet, which is completely contrary to what we had expected. So let me show you just a bit of, oh, and then um, also, can the length of exposure affect the outcome? And the answer to that is yes. If we gave a short-term folic acid, we didn't see these unexpected increased risk. It was only when we did this longer-term diet. So some, again, there haven't been very many cases. There have only been about 20, 25 um, mouse mutants that have been tested for folic acid responsiveness. So this is taking our data as well as others, but most of the other cases are from, again, short-term folic acid diets. But um, 
we found that there were some mutants that we had that showed no responsiveness of folic acid. So this is a long-term kind of our control or moderate diet, and then the, the enriched or folic acid diet. And so some of them don't change, and that's not surprising. We know in, in humans that, again, about 65% are not responsive to folic acid. Um, but one of these, SHRIM-3, actually had a beneficial effect in response to folic acid if we just gave it for a short term, just through the period of pregnancy. But when we gave it long term, that beneficial effect went away. Don't understand why, but. Um, there were a few that we had and other, other cases have shown that there can be a beneficial response like we would expect. So if you give folic acid, you can decrease the risk. I mean, it's not statistically significant, but it's biologically significant. These are embryos that normally 100% would have a neural tube defect, and there's a few of them that don't, and so that's biologically significant. But really where our surprise came is that we had other mutants that um, had an increased risk for neural tube defects on the enriched folic acid diet, again, contrary to expectations. So where we've gone from, the, from here, this, these studies were published, but we ended up realizing that of the three cases, there is at least a, some link to um, genes that might be involved in cilia formation. So let me just tell you a little bit about cilia. So cilia actually starting originally from the mouse mutants but that my lab and Katherine Anderson's lab worked on, we originally found that cilia, these little um, primary cilia that extend a little antenna out from the cell membrane and traffic comp signaling components of, um, back and forth into the nucleus, we had found that cilia are incredibly important for early embryonic um, pattern formation. And so it's been a whole cottage industry ever since then. There's lots and lots of genes that we know of that are required for cilia. And we also know about a lot of ciliopathies. So um, if you have, essentially every cell in your, in your body has a cilia, either a primary cilia or um, multiciliated cells. And those are required for um, many, many aspects of embryonic development as well as in adult health and disease. And so there's many different types of ciliopathies that can be found. And um, I'm gonna come back and tell you about these multiciliated cells. So we have primary cilia that are required for embryonic or signal transduction. And these multiciliated cells are more involved in generating flow. They beat in a, in a coordinated fashion. And so in your respiratory tract, they beat up to send out mucus and, and bad bacteria and things. Um, and in the, I'm gonna talk about in the lateral ventricle, they're involved in um, uh, generating flow of the cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, so we had all of these cilia mutants because cilia, primary cilia and, and hedgehog signaling are really important for neural tube closure. So we decided to test um, our cilia mutants to find out might this be a biological pathway that's more sensitive to folic acid levels? And indeed, that seems to be the case. And so there's some mutants that were not responsive to folic acid, not, you know, still have 100% neural tube defects no matter the level of folic acid. But then we had another set of mutants that again had this surprising effect of an increased risk for neural tube defects um, on enriched folic acid. This allele, which is a hypomorph, it has a really low level of uh, neural tube defects, but it actually has polydactyly too many digits. And, um, and again, if, it, if we, on the enriched folic acid diet, those, those phenotypes are 100%, but on a moderate level or, or a lower percent. So really, if we flip this the other way, might it be that for cilia mutants, might it be more beneficial to be taking a moderate level of folic acid? So not to be kind of on this higher side of folic acid supplementation, but maybe moderate levels are important. So we then wanted to, that was mouse, right? Who knows, maybe the mouse doesn't have anything relevant to human. And so through Joe Gleason's lab, who works on ciliopathies in human patients, um, he sent us some cells to test. It ends up that we grow cells in whopping 
amounts of folic acid. So your normal media is about 4,000 um, nanograms per mil, which is, um, in, if in serum, it's more like, even at a high level in serum in humans, it's about 25 nanograms. So I don't know why we do this, but that's what our media has. So we thought, well, maybe we'd like to be able to try to recapitulate this using human cells, where obviously we can't do this in, in the embryo. And so what we did was to just take different levels of folic acid and grow these ciliopathy cells in them. And what we find in both mouse and in human, if we grow those cells in a more moderate level of folic acid, that's beneficial for cilia, either cilia number or cilia length, which is involved in function. And so that's kind of shown here, that we get an increased length that starts to normalize more toward um, controls. But interestingly, even in a control, um, we found an effect that higher levels of folate actually decreased cilia, in this case cilia length, and moderate levels increased that. So that made us start wondering, might we see effects in um, even wild type or heterozygous animals? Everything I showed you prior to this was in homozygous mutants. And so we went back, and then we also wanted to ask, all of this is looking at primary cilia, so we wanted to know whether multi, uh, motile, multiciliated cells might also have a defect. And so um, this is doing a scanning electron micrograph of the cilia that line the lateral ventricles that are involved in moving of the cerebral spinal fluid. And so they're supposed to beat in a coordinated manner in order to be able to effectively move and generate flow. And so on a moderate diet, you can see that these cilia are kind of really all pointing pretty much in the same direction, which is shown through this histogram. But if we have them on an enriched folic acid diet, and again, this is heterozygous animals that we're talking about that are perfectly fine and you know we didn't know any defect, but you can see that one, the, the cilia become much more randomized, which is shown by this histogram, and they're actually shorter as well. So if you do experiments to actually look at the flow, what we found is if we look at our heterozygous mutant for two different cilia lines, we see the same um, effect, that moderate levels of folic acid have a more normalized flow, cilia flow, but on an enriched diet, um, that flow is much, much less than it should be. And if we look at the wild types, we find similar results, even in a wild type animal if um, we give enriched folic acid, cilia flow is decreased in the wild type relative to a moderate diet. And interestingly, um, the heterozygous animals of the cilia mutant actually become more normalized to wild type on the moderate diet. And that's just kind of shown through this PCA plot that you can see in a wild type if we're now looking at, at cilia length and cilia uniformity and flow rate and do a multidimensional plot with PCA plot. Um, wild type on a moderate diet separates even from a wild type on an enriched diet, indicating they're more different from one another. Whereas the heterozygous animals starts to overlap, heterozygous animals on the wild type, um, sorry, on the moderate diet start to overlap wild type. And the big outlier, again, is the cilia het mutant with a enriched folate diet, indicating that it's less similar than wild type. So we then kind of have been looking at this and scratching our head and trying again to figure out what's happening with folic acid and looking at these cilia mutants and trying to understand how diet is affecting the genotype. So what's this gene environment effect? And so we've done RNA-seq analysis. And if we look at, again at our animals that are on this moderate diet, which are more normalized, um, they have genes that are disrupted, or you know, their transcriptome is disrupted relative to what we would expect for a cilia mutant. So it's involved in hedgehog signaling, so we see hedgehog defects. But now if we take the same mutant and we look at the transcriptome on this enriched folic acid diet, now we see much higher gene dysregulation in these mutant animals. So if we kind of peer in at this set of genes, it kind of makes sense that it would have a, a 
exacerbation of a cilia defect because we see cilia genes here as well as epigenetic um, regulation genes. And the other thing that this is raised, and in the next slide I'll show you as well from our epigenetic mutants, is might it just be, so sit back for a second. Normally, we have two cells. And these two cells that are sitting as neighbors, there's a robustness to the system. They're not making exactly the same number of gene transcripts in this cell as in that cell. But overall, it, the system's pretty robust, and it's relatively equal to one another. What seems to be happening here is that you have just a much higher gene dysregulation between the two. And again, when you have to have this tightly coordinated process to close a neural tube, it, it's just shifting how these cells can talk to one another um, might be enough to cause a collapse of the system. And that's also kind of arisen from, from these epigenetic regulators. So, you know, we had been studying this mutant and we kind of put it through the normal studies that we normally do to try to figure out what's going wrong to cause a neural tube defect. And we just couldn't figure it out. Finally went to RNA-seq. And you see the same thing, is in this multidimensional plot, if you look at the transcriptome of animals that are wild type, they all group nicely together, indicating that their transcriptional profile is very similar to one another. But when we look at these mutants that now are a mutant in a chromatin remodeling complex, they, none of them group with wild type, but they don't actually group with themselves either. So what that's saying is that their transcriptional profile is different, but their transcriptional profile is actually different from one another as well. So if we look at all of those genes, there's only about 27 that overlap, and they don't actually make a lot of sense. So again, just this idea that kind of a transcriptional noise, taking that robustness out of the system of how two cells can interact with one another during this very tightly coordinated process might be enough to increase your risk for neural tube defects. So to just kind of summarize what I told you is like, if we think about this green line here as being a potential genetic makeup, and if you have kind of a moderate level of folic acid, you have a low risk for neural tube defects. And if you have more folic acid, you still have a low risk for neural tube defects. And there's certainly some genetic mutations that when um, on a moderate level of folate can have a higher risk, and if you increase the folate, can, then folate enrichment can be beneficial. But there also may be certain gene mutations, in this case perhaps cilia mutations, that um, have a, a risk at um, a moderate level of folic acid, but if you increase the folic acid, they may have an even higher risk of neural tube defects. And so this balance that maybe everything in moderation. So folate is good. We don't want too little folate, that's for sure. But there may be a level of folate that um, perhaps exceeds a beneficial dose. With that said, in the human population, we have now many people, over 25% of the population exceeds um, the, the maximum daily recommended dose for folic acid through supplementation and fortification. So again, we started from this question of, is neural tube prevention always due to a rescue? Does a neural tube close? No, in some cases, yes. But in some cases, it could be due to this earlier embryonic lethality. So you don't even recognize it as a pregnancy. And then might some gene mutations or cellular processes um, benefit from a moderate level of folic acid? And we would say yes, I think in terms of thinking about cilia. Um, uh, we've tested, um, we've tested seven different strains and five of them uh, respond more beneficially to moderate folate than enriched folate, and the other two were non-responsive. And so this is where I'm gonna get provocative. Um, so in the mutants that we've tested, I told you that ciliopathies um, can affect many tissues and organs. And so we've looked at our mutants, so we've looked, I showed you data for whether they're neural tube defect risk, I told you a little bit about limb patterning defects and lateral 
ventricle uh, multiciliated cells. So in all those cases, moderate folate was, was more beneficial. But we've looked at other places, and we see, at least have preliminary data that indicate fertility is more defective on enriched folate, which there's cilia that line the fallopian tubes in the uterus. Um, we've looked at olfaction. Again, cilia um, are involved in that. We've looked at the kidney, where cilia are involved. In all of these cases, the ciliopathies become worse with the enriched folate. And so being really provocative, and I've talked to clinicians about this, and there's no real answer to this, but we recognize ciliopathies much more now. And so it's always a question of, is that ascertainment? We know so much more about cilia. We, you know, as I said, it's a cottage industry. Everybody's kind of looking at what are the genes involved and how do they act. But could it be that we're taking folic acid? We've been taking folic acid now for multiple generations. And might it be that there's actually an increased risk for ciliopathies due to this increase of, the, of folic acid that we're taking throughout the US population? In other work that we're not working on, and um, it, I could, I'll say it's controversial, but there's been some suggestions that there might be other diseases that um, may be responding, uh, that may have an uh, increased risk due to increased folate. So people have wondered in terms of asthma, in terms of autism, in terms of autoimmune diseases, um, cancers, uh, Folate could be beneficial precancerous, but once a cancer starts through its role in proliferation, enriched folate may not be beneficial for that. So I just think it's um, something for us to think about, and again, everything in moderation, and that the genetics of an individual may, depend, may determine the appropriate balance in folic acid supplementation. And so I'll just end. Um, there's lots of things that we do in the lab. There's wonderful collaborators that we're working on on the human um, side. Uh, it's been a great, I was prior to a year and a half ago, I was at the Anschutz campus, and much of the work was done there, and I really appreciate all the support there in trying to understand this. And um, really, most of this work has been done by Julie Peterson, Amber Marian, and David Engelhart. Thank you. That was a great way to uh, end our afternoon. I, I love that talk. So um, there's a drug called Deplin, um, which in psychiatry we're giving to nearly everybody for everything. And it's, uh, it's levomethylfolate, and it's 15 milligrams. So it's a wampum dose. Um, we've had a lot of people with refractory depression respond to it. Um, when I say a lot of people, these are very treatment refractory patients by the time you're doing it. But everybody is taking it from the internet. And um, I wonder if you'd comment on, uh, on what you think about the uh, use of levomethylfolate as a nutraceutical for, if you look at the websites, it turns out it cures everything in the whole world. <laughs> um, obviously, we haven't done any work ourselves on that, but... I, I wouldn't be taking it. <laughs> I can tell you that. So. so I have the mic. So can we move two slides back? Uh -huh. You have a comment at the bottom. Yeah. So I want to point this to uh, Down syndrome, which I worked on this uh, a few years ago. So there's an observation that Down syndrome child will have lower level of SAM in the blood. So presumably that will lead to potentially lower DNA methylation. So we, we were working on something different, but on Down syndrome as well. We were looking at the placenta of Down's uh, fetus uh, using a, a technology called RBS, mm -hmm. looking at DNA methylation levels. We were shocked, it was, it was published a few years ago, that in Down's placenta, over 90, I forgot, I forgot the number, but over 95 or 96 uh, of the methylation, significant, significantly uh, changed methylation regions are, are higher level of methylation or hypermethylation. It was hyper. Yeah, even so they that was also published by other people as well, but we have a more comprehensive data set. Yeah. So that was obviously contradictory. Uh -huh. Lower SAM, but higher DNA methylation. Uh -huh. 
And this is also linked to what you are saying, so folic acid intake. So maybe, uh, I'm, you, since you mentioned provocative many times at the end, maybe another provocative idea is if we know uh, you are pregnant with a Down's baby. Maybe you need really need reduced folic acid levels. Maybe the Down's baby maybe won't be that hypermethylated, and maybe some of the phenotype will be less severe. I mean, I cannot do this study in China because everyone who knows the Down's baby will have abortion. So as there's absolutely no chance to do that research. But maybe with animal models or even well, human. and there's not. There doesn't really actually seem to be a very strong correlation between your SAM levels. I mean, we're, start, we're trying to get more at this, but the SAM levels and then the methylation levels. Because we've done our RBS as well on some of these samples. And we do see differential methylation, but it's not, it, you know, some genes are, are down, their, their methylation status is down, and others it's up. And, and so other you, studies you need to look at, methyl. look. I think the best way is to look at the important regions, promoter regions. These are more functionally relevant. If you look at just a few genes or look at repetitive sequence, I mean, it's difficult yeah. to, to predict the functions. But we can even throw SAM out. The observation that Down's uh, individuals have hypermethylation, at least in the percent of Down's, we, we check on the fetal side. So presumably these are fetal cells. Mm -hmm. It's, it's dramatic, yeah. okay, so. It's an interesting thought. So I don't know, yeah. then maybe significantly reduced folic acid levels will, uh, you know, reduce that effect and that may be beneficial. I don't know, I, you know, you use provocative. <laughs> uh, so the, and, you know, and this is the, well, and, and the, I guess moderation to me is what's important. We, again, you don't want to go too low because we do know that that can cause a lot of problems and can shift the whole pathway the other way. So. Yeah, but I do think we are taking a lot of folic acid now, more than we need. Yeah. I, 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 in the, when you showed us the data for early embryonic lethality in mice from the litters that you looked at, my brain said, holy moly, most of the improvement, I think you were saying this, most of the improvement in the diminishing of spinal bifida was due to most, not all, to early embryonic lethality. So the country supplemented grains and essentially did a morning after pill for people. <laughs> well, that's what it was for people with spinal, for embryos with spinal bifida without knowing that they were doing that. Is, am I wrong? Did I misunderstand that? No, that's it. I, I think I, I think that's interesting, but 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 let's let's not focus on the fact that it didn't work for everybody. Let's focus on the promotion of embryonic lethality of a compromised as, uh, of a compromised embryo. embryo in mice in big litter, litters. Right. But a remarkable thing to be mandated by the U.S. government is my thought. Well, and. And I will throw one other piece of data in there, is that um, for cardiovascular defects that can affect, like really early ones that have pretty severe problems, that also has shifted over time to be decreased. And so, um, oh gosh, all of a sudden I can't think of his name, but um, cardiovascular scientist at the Gladstone in San Francisco, when I told him about this work, he's like, Ah, the same idea. Why has the incidence of these cardiovascular defects gone down? Maybe because, again, you have this very compromised embryo because the heart is forming at the same time as the neural tube. Just don't tell Trump. <laughs> right here. S sorry, two things. First, the example of um, lethality reminds me of a wonderful um, statistical lesson from the Second World War and I can't rem remember the name of the statistician, but there was analysis done on bombers returning from bombing raids over Germany to, to the UK. And they were trying to decide where do we put the armor on bombers. And of course, the more armor you put on a bomber, the less bombs you can carry. And in the end, they decided to put the armor where the bullet holes aren't, right? Because 
The bombers that returned to the UK with bullet holes in them show that you didn't need armour in those places, right? You need, you need the armour where the bullet holes aren't. And, and, and that seems exactly the same bias we're seeing here. The second question relates to a possible natural experiment. Um, and this may uh, betray my ignorance of folate metabolism. But um, people with rheumatoid arthritis, a great number of them have taken methotrexate for a great number of years. And then they also take a very high folate dose 24 hours later. So I wonder if there's any evidence of adult onset ciliopathies in the rheumatoid arthritis population. Yeah, yeah so, well, I mean, when you're on methotrexate, they suggest that you don't become pregnant because of, of the problems with the folate pathway. And that's then why they give this much larger dose. Now, beyond that, in what clinical outcomes were, I don't, I don't know. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, are there any tests being developed that take into account individual differences in determining what folate level is best for each person? Uh, that's where we hope to get. So far, we've only seen um, data that really, we really, I mean, honestly, I don't want to be sitting on the side of saying, mm, you know, maybe much more is bad. Um, so, so no, we don't, right now we just give folate to everyone and we don't know whether there's going to be particular genetic pathways or things that are going to be more responsive one way or another. Um, and so that's still going to have to play out with time. And I will caution you, right, what I've mostly told you about is mouse studies. And what I've also told you is, is largely, you know, thinking about homozygous mutants in a pure genetic background. So you have to take everything I said with a grain of salt, but, um, but it is a, a system that allows us to be able to at least kind of more cleanly get at that answer, hopefully. Well, th th thanks for, well, I mean, it's not my field, but uh, I say, uh, thank you for this very informative presentation, also for a provocative conclusion. Sorry, <clears throat> just wanted, I can't refrain from saying that in, there have been uh, now uh, dozens of very large clinical trials, largely funded by the NCI around the planet, uh, um, to test whether supplements, essentially vitamin supplements, uh, or micro, um, some micronutrient supplement, could uh, reduce cancer risk. Uh, as of today, the final conclusion is that there is no evidence whatsoever that taking uh, supplements reduces cancer risk. There is a definite evidence that taking beta-carotene increases risk of lung cancer based on a trial of 20,000 people in uh, Finland, the ATBC trial, alpha tocopherol beta-carotene trial. Uh, on 20,000 people uh, uh, ran for seven years. The CAR uh, CARET trial run in the US they both showed an increased incidence and mortality of lung cancer in the people who under beta-carotene compared to the control trial. The SELECT trial showed that uh, there are serious side effects of taking selenium supplement, right? And there is not a single trial that showed a preventive effect with one exception, which is calcium for uh, uh, colorectal polyps. So as of today, if you talk about vitamins and micronutrients, there is nothing for cancer that recommends taking the supplements, and the official recommendation of the American Institute for Cancer Research is do not take supplements. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> so my question is about cancer as well. So with all the... I think you'll answer it better than me. <laughs> with all the imaging that, that has been, that's being done now with MRI and CAT scans and all that, people are, people are finding a lot of subclinical spots, you know. Uh, so many more people than we ever knew have subclinical cancers that are slow growing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, we've known for a long time that men beyond a certain age almost all have prostate cancer at some level. So isn't that a really good reason to avoid folic acid? Tumor cells love folic acid. That's why methotrexate has been used for so long. So wouldn't that be really adv advisable to stay away from folic acid, especially after a certain age? No, no, I mean, uh, multivitamin pills is what I mean. If you look at a bottle of multivitamin pills, 
The, the folic acid dose is, is several huge. times the, the daily allowance. It's actually pretty high. Yeah, and you know, total cereal, if you have one serving, and I think Americans have two, you know, that's 100% that's right there, you know, and just one serving. It's been added yeah. to it. Yeah, because yeah. that's in our fortified grains. Well, we're going to end by saying that all the things we're doing are crazy, just like we knew 10 years ago all the things we were doing were crazy. And I'm reminded when Woody Allen says in Sleeper, didn't you have hot fudge and tobacco? Um, anyway, thank you all for a fabulous afternoon. Thanks to all our speakers. Thanks again for a fabulous symposium. I will uh, see you all tomorrow. And uh, hope you